a doctrinal matter from the Old Testament, one that we have dealt with before. As a matter of fact, I checked my notes from the past to get dates, and I taught a message on this on February the 9th, 1983, which would, as you could see, therefore make that just about exactly uh, seven years ago, a little over that. So it's not something that's new to you. It's something that you have heard before. And so maybe in addition to recovering this material, maybe it's been a while since some of you have heard it. I know for some of you it has not been a long time. You've heard it even recently. But maybe, maybe not only will we go over this material and some of these matters and touch on them again, but I hope that we can also use the teaching to to learn a certain lesson from as, as to how we are to receive the truth and, and certainly what, what is wrong and how we are not to uh, approach the word whenever it's being presented to us. The matter that we're going to be discussing is over in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Now the big problem with Genesis six uh, in charismatic circles and charismatics aren't the only ones if you read the commentaries who are a little bit deluded about the message of genesis six but they certainly charismatics are ones who are deceived here some of them anyway and the big problem is not so much and i'm underscoring the phrase so much because it is a problem that someone is in doctrinal error in fact they are but whenever someone refuses to give heed to the truth whenever it's clearly presented, then that presents a problem to me. That is a real stumbling block to me, and it really makes me suspicious why whenever someone hears the truth and you're a charismatic believer and you have the Holy Spirit in you and the truth should just register on you, you shouldn't have to say, well, that's your opinion and I'm going to have to search this out some more and... You know, it's as though some people detest having to admit that they're wrong and give up their belief, maybe a long-cherished one or whatever, but humble themselves, admit that they're wrong, submit, submit to me, to you, to us, no, but to the Bible's teaching on this in Genesis 6. And I could leave matters like this well enough alone, but sometimes others don't seem to wish to leave matters like this well enough alone. I have generally found that whenever someone is just, they have a certain opinion or doctrine in their mind and they do not wish to change from that, then uh, it is really a waste of our time to try to convince them of the truth. You're just going to have to wait until someone is, someone is open, someone who has air and not the light, and you're going to have to wait until they are open before they're going to be a willing, be a candidate, sit before your feet and hear what you have to say. But it's interesting that those, and this has been the case of heretics and deceivers, and I mean, that's just the way that it has been, and true believers who have air in their life. They're all different types of departures from the Word of God. But it's just been the case down through church history that those who do not have the truth will never cease, will never stop trying to insinuate and spread their delusions rather than just leave well enough alone rather than fear the truth and fear the word of god enough to say oh i guess i just don't know what i'm talking about or i'm not convinced that i do so i'm going to put my hand over my mouth until i am certain beyond a shadow of a doubt about this the devil uses people in instances like that to try to spread delusions about the word of god Amen. and then you know what often happens those who have the truth end up getting intimidated and they close their mouth. And so air has taken over in the church down through 2,000 years of church history, and it has been championed by the heretics of the Christian church, by heretics, by deceivers, by sincere people who are sincerely wrong about certain matters in the Word of God. They don't close their mouth and stop talking about it. So I'll say again, I could leave matters like this well enough alone, but if others... Uh, don't wish to embrace the truth, that, that's their business, but if they hold the air and if they try to minister air to others, especially if they would try to minister to any air to me or to anybody in this church, then I'm generally not going to be too silent about that. You see, whenever you hold to air, it's never right to try to share that with someone else. Amen. 
course, you know, people say, well, I don't believe I hold air. That's why I'm trying to share it. I believe it's true. We talked about reductio ad absurdum and systematic theology and epistemology and various ways of theological argumentation. It's never right to try to make fun of or mock the truth of the word of God because then you're found resisting God himself. The only people who have the right and the authority to heap scorn, quote unquote, upon others like Jesus did to the scribes of his day are those people who hold to the truth. Of course, that's the whole problem with delusion. You think out there that you're holding to the truth when you don't, and so you heap scorn on those that you think are wrong when in fact they're right. That's the whole problem with the matter. But whenever someone who doesn't hold to the truth tries to minister that to other people or to sud subtly try to cast doubt against their view or upon their view, then that's a major problem as far as God is concerned. If we are wrong or if we even suspect that we are wrong or if we even suspect that we might be wrong, it's best to be quiet about it. Then you'll be held accountable only for deceiving yourself. If, in fact, that's the last state of your life, assuming that you don't get the truth before you leave this world, you'll be held accountable only for deceiving yourself and not deceiving yourself and someone else as well. So it's so important to know the word of God and have these matters settled in our mind. But there are other matters than just being able to turn to a passage, chapter, and verse like Genesis 6 or other things that people think are related that aren't related or other ways in the word of God where you can demonstrate what the truth of Genesis 6, 1 to 4 is. That's all one matter. We're going to somewhat deal with that this morning. But we're also going to deal with some of the thoughts and principles and machinations that lie behind this whole matter because they lie behind every erroneous departure from the faith and from the truth. I hope that all that we've been saying in epistemology, in systematic theology, I hope all that's coming across clearly enough. These are real important matters here. To know how to talk, to know... Some people just plain don't know how to talk. They just don't know how to think. They just don't know how to reason. And about trying to reduce the truth to an absurd conclusion, well, I keep saying it, a person's going to be found to be up against God in the last day. Of course, they don't think that they are, but uh, maybe we could say that's part of the whole problem, or maybe that's uh, a major part of the whole problem. What I call this that I see in other people sometimes is a real extreme independence that people have. And we should, I mean, I guess people want to feel comfortable with the fact that, hey, I'm a believer, I'm a charismatic Christian, I own a copy of the Bible, why, why do I have to listen to somebody else? You, you don't have to. Why can't I just get into the Word of God and get the truth for myself? You can. But see, just because you don't have to listen to someone else and because you can get into the Word of God and find the truth doesn't mean that you always do. And if and when in those areas you don't, then you may have to listen to what somebody else has to say. And so what we have on our hands, I would call, is a real extreme independence where someone has a view, they are presented with the right interpretation of the passage, and they say something like this, well, I'm going to have to search that out for myself. I'm not just going to follow your teaching. Well, then why, I would ask the question, did God put teachers in the church then? There is a balance here. We're not asking anyone to follow everything any teacher has to say. But why did God put teachers in the church if we're not supposed to follow what they have to say? At least give it some serious consideration. And whenever it's obvious that they're teaching the Word, then you don't have any choice. But you're bound to follow what they have to say. But others say, well, you know, it's, this, it's almost like people are jealous that someone else has the truth first or the truth over against them. And they just resent having to admit that they're wrong and giving it up because then that's going to sound like I'm having to agree with your position and then that would sound like I'm somehow underneath you. You know, people ought to forget and, and race out of their mind all of these uh, uh, social club, soap opera type things of who's under who and all that. That's not even part of the picture. The devil will bring that up in your mind, try to make it a part of the matter, but it's not. It's truth and error. It's a big question of the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. It's not who had the truth first. God had the truth first. So that's who we're submitting to is God and to his word. 
a real extreme independence, I'm going to have to search this out on my own. Well, listen, here's my problem. If someone else has already searched it out on their own and they found the truth and shared it with you, and now you're telling me you're going to have to search it out on your own, well, I can only end up with one idea of what their conclusion is going to be, but a rejection of the truth. Why would you need to search it out on your own if you are clearly rejecting what someone else has searched out on their own and found to be the truth? You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of the same situation whenever you communicate some truth from the Word of God to another individual, another Christian, let's say, and they tell you, I'm going to have to go home and pray about that. What answer could you hear? What answer could you want to hear? But an erroneous conclusion, an erroneous belief. If someone has shared the word of God with you, I mean, I thought John says that we have an anointing of the Holy One, 1 John 2, 20, and we know all things. I thank God. I don't think I'm the type of person whenever, generally whenever someone has the truth on their side, I can hear it. I may not like what I hear. I may tell them I'm going to have to go home and search that out on my own the whole time I'm walking away mumbling and grumbling and complaining that they beat me to the truth. But at least I believe that I know in my heart, whenever I hear the truth, I know they've got the truth on their side. I might not really like to hear it, but I'm not going to say I'm going to have to go home and search that out because what am I going to find? What am I expecting to find? Something contrary to what that person just shared with me. And if they've shared the truth and what's contrary to it is a delusion then. It's the same situation, friends. Whenever something is presented clearly enough and in enough detail from the Word of God, and someone says, I'm going to have to go search that out. You've got a problem in your heart. That's what you've got a problem in. When a person hears something and they say, I'm going to have to go pray about that, you tell them that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's in Acts, and you give them the passages. It's after salvation, and all of this business, all that you can say about the baptism, well, I'm going to have to pray about that. You know what you're going to hear when you go ask God He's not going to talk to you again. He already told you by sending John or Mary to you, and they shared the baptism with you. He's not going to talk to you again. The only thing you're going to hear is a deceiving spirit that says the baptism's not for today. Go pray about it. I had one woman just about convinced, a female pastor, just about convinced that she was wrong. She even called me up to find out all the details. Well, I've never heard it like this. I've never, so I'm going to have to pray about this over this weekend. She prayed about it over the weekend and came back Monday morning deceived about it. And it's still deceived down to this day. So close and yet so far, almost thou persuadest me to believe, said King Agrippa to Paul, almost persuaded. Think of how close that woman was to the truth. You know, when, you, when I look back on it, you, you could kind of chasten yourself and wish that you would have hung the phone up and driven to their house quickly and beat on their door and shared more with them, but you can only say so much. And I said a whole lot, and they said, you know, you've really got a point, and this may be right, and, and she said, well, you know, if what you're telling me is right, that means I'm going to have to admit that all that I've learned thus far is wrong. She at least was intelligent enough to know that. And that this big leader that I sat under his ministry at his Bible school, and he's just an international figure, and who are you, you know, that he is an heir. She said, that's a big step I'm going to have to take. And I said, yeah, I realize all that, but it's a bigger step that you take whenever you say you're sitting under the big leader called God in heaven when you're really not. It's one thing to have to admit that this big charismatic leader is wrong. And she chose not to do that. But in the process of doing that, she admitted that the big leader, God, is wrong. Because God says women can't pastor. And this charismatic leader says that women can't. So who are you going to believe then? Bible says that demons or fallen angels don't mate with human women. The Bible's real clear on that. And, uh, and the devil says that they do because he would rather people believe a lie and hope that he can drag them from one lie to another lie so you've got your choice which one you want to believe. Well, I think that the Bible is clear that it teaches that demons can. Well, you can think all you want to. But your thoughts are just like muddy water, though. And the Bible is clear. And the Bible, what God intends to do with the Word of God, is to use it as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path to cast light into the darkness of our life. But what people try to do is bring their darkness and cast it upon the Bible to try to help shed some light on some passage. They bring some 
myths and fables about demigods and titans and rabbinic exegesis and try to bring all of that darkness to bear upon a passage, Genesis 6, 1 to 4, and hope they can come up with the right interpretation thereby. And you can't. There's not anything brighter or more luminous than the Word of God. And when you try to bring something else, some sociological fact or medical statistic or something from uh, Greek mythology to bear upon the Word of God and to help understand the Word of God, you're trying to employ darkness to understand a book of light. And you can only end up with confusion in your own life. I'd like for you to turn over to the New Testament, first of all, if you will. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 here was the highest praise, I think, that the Apostle Paul could express on behalf of the Thessalonians when he says that when they received the word of God, and it was through a human messenger, the Apostle Paul and company, they didn't treat it just like a word of man, so they're going to have to go home and research these matters and see whether or not they can outfigure, outthink the Apostle Paul. But because they were elect and because they were sheep they received the word even though it was word from a man as though it were not the word of a man but the very word of God which indeed it was it was the very word of God for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when ye receive the word of God which ye heard of us so it's God's word through human vessels ye received it not as the word of men you see, that's how other people receive the truth from you if they really don't receive it. You know, if they say, well, I'm willing to listen, I'll, I'll hear you out on this, but they're receiving the word of God as though it were the word of a man. Because, you know, if they were truly convinced it was the word of God, you just submit and bow to it, and you agree with it. They're receiving the word of God as though it's the word of a man. But Paul said, contrary wise, you didn't receive the word of God as though it were the word of a man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So you see, before we get into the study of Genesis 6 and say a few things about that this morning, I, I just want to share all this as introduction because what I'm saying right now applies to every area of doctrine and not just to Genesis 6. It applies to every area. We have to be the type of people, and I, it's a mysterious matter. I couldn't, uh, to the nth degree, explain it all to you. It is a mysterious matter. But we have to be the type of people, enough knowledge already of the Word of God, and I don't know how you first start getting the Word but by grace, and how you end up getting it but by grace. But we have to have enough of the Word of God and enough of the inner witness of the Holy Spirit that whenever we are in the air and we hear someone else present the truth, we just agree with it with maybe one or two little small problems or whatever, but basically we agree, and of course the ideal is no problems at all. And I think it's, if it's presented clearly enough, and if we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, then it won't be receiving the word with one or two small problems. We'll just say, you know, that's right. And so whatever I think is a problem, I must be wrong about that. I don't see things clearly yet. But what you're saying is just right. The whole essence or the whole spirit of what you're saying speaks to me of nothing but the truth from the Word of God. So if I think I've got a few hang-ups here, those are my hang-ups. Now, it's all right to ask questions about them so that you're not hung by your own hang-ups, but we have to recognize that the fault's probably not with the truth, as though that, well, I can see the truth, but I can also see the other side. A person is simply not in a right state of existence before God to say, well, I can see the truth, but I can see your point of view also. That's that old pluralistic latitudinarian spirit that has just taken over American society today, where you are encouraged to say, it is a plus for you to say, well, I see your side and I see my side. I, you're, we're supposed to only be able to see God's side. and Whatever conflicts with that, we, we violently disagree with. Violently, not with physical force or anything, but I mean with all that is within us. We better flee from error and not even be tempted to embrace it at all. Amen. We have to know from the Word of God. So people try and put their scholar's cap back on. Well, I'm going to have to go and research this. But really, if I can say this kindly, it's a dunce cap. 
is what they're putting back on. Uh, while we're over here in the end of the New Testament, how about 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20? This is a verse that, and you see, I say this verse in light of all of our so-called scholarly teachings around here. <laughs> that's not my, somebody, somebody, that's not my phrase. Somebody else was visiting the church one time and called me a theologian and then apologized, I think, and just said, well, he's a man. Well, that's where you ought to leave it. There aren't any theologians in the Bible. There are apostles and prophets and evangelists, but somebody must think that they're scholarly teaching. So in light of that, 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of knowledge. The word is knowledge, not science in the Greek. Not like is science versus sociology or civics. And oppositions of knowledge, falsely so-called. That happens to be a real favorite verse of mine because we really believe in knowledge. Knowledge is really important. God's people perish for lack of knowledge. This is knowledge falsely so-called. People will say, I've got some knowledge. That's what they mean by, I'm going to go research this matter. And I've got some books on my shelves and you pull all your books off and you look. But you know, all that is a vain pursuit whenever you're doing that to try to circumvent something that's clearly stated in the Word of God. Then that doesn't impress any other scholar or any other lay person in the church, it certainly doesn't impress God. When you say, I'm going to put my scholar's cap on to check this out, and you really put your dunce cap on to check it out. And Paul tells Timothy, oh, Timothy, it is a plea here to him. Anytime we say, oh, how often do you say, oh, to someone? And it's not an oh, ouch, as in pain or something. It's an oh, as though you're trying to reach them. You're trying to pour out your heart to them. Oh, Timothy, don't be deceived about anything. Whatever's been committed to your trust, keep it. Amen. And avoid profane and vain babblings. That's what they are. You're going to hear some of those this morning that even come out of the mouth of sincere people, profane and vain babblings that come out of their mouth in an attempt to overthrow the truth of the word of God. And then Paul says it's oppositions. People try to oppose. They are called opponents, you know, of the truth. And they may be sincere. We all find ourselves at one time or another in our life on the wrong side of the fence. Oppositions of science or knowledge, falsely so-called. It's opposition. They call it knowledge, but Paul said it's got a false name to it. It's got a false name. Paul says earlier in the New Testament that God takes the wise in their own craftiness and that God rejects the wisdom of this world. God rejects the wisdom of all of these scholars out there. You know, these people who say, I, I've got to go home, you know, when you present the truth, and I've got to go home and research and research, and they do that, research and research and research and research, and you know, I think you come dangerously close to reminding me of what goes on in the seminaries out there, ever learning, but, I'll let you finish the sentence there, ever learning. Now I've got some new insight. You're ever learning. You can add some little facts and statistics there and you read some mystical, mythical book on titans or demigods and they try to give you some light on the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Ever learning. And now you found a new book that holds to the same old fallen angel demon theory over there. And so now I have another way of attacking the truth. Now I can manipulate this Greek term over in the New Testament. Now I understand this Hebrew word and I can manipulate it to my to my advantage and to my use, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the sad state that the seminaries and the Bible schools are in out there. They're learning a whole lot, ever learning, as a matter of fact. And charismatics are the same way, ever learning every new thing, but they never are able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'd like to say it like this, sooner or later, research must come to an end and faith has to begin. Amen. When the Word of God is there and you can see it, you don't need to do any more research. Now it's a question of whether or not you're going to believe what's in the Word of God. And some people don't want to believe it, so they say, I'm going to research some more. That is just a ploy, that is a smokescreen to get away from God's commandment to believe what His Word has to say. The Bible says that sons of God came into daughters of men. The Bible doesn't say anything about fallen angels or demons cohabiting, marrying, mating with human females and producing an offspring, a race of giants from that. That's in the fertile imagination of some people's minds, but it's not in the Word of God. 
Now, sooner or later, somewhere, I don't know where you're going to draw the line. I draw it pretty fast, though. Research has to come to an end, and faith has to begin. We're required to believe this word. Sure, we're required to study it out. But whenever someone has presented the view, and some people have heard our view on Genesis 6, and you can't, you can't overcome that, all you can do is try to bring up points that aren't related and say, I'm going to research and research and research the matter some more. But we better be very careful in areas like this. We talked about rationalism in epistemology, that it is one of several answers to our acquisition of knowledge. But you can be too rational, though. I mean, you can get into rationalism and just say, I've got to study and prove and prove and prove and prove this point, like resident ministry. We've said enough on resident ministry. It's the truth in the Word of God. But someone can say, well, now, you didn't cover this. We never claimed we covered everything that could be covered. I don't even know that I know everything that could be covered. I guess only God knows that. And so they use that, you know. It's been a stumbling block to me because there were two other areas you didn't cover. What are you going to do with the areas that we did cover, though? When are you going to stop researching and stop thinking and start believing the Word of God? You see what I'm saying this morning? There comes a time you've got to stop thinking, that is, thinking independent from God. You've got to stop thinking and just start believing the Word of God. If you don't, you're going to get deceived in your life. Yeah. I quoted earlier 1 Corinthians 3, which I think Paul is taking from Job, that he takes the wise in their own craftiness. You know how he does that sometimes? By just letting them go their way. I'll give you a good example. 1 Kings chapter 22, where the king of Israel, he really wanted to go up and fight this battle at Ramoth Gilead and take it away from the Syrians. He really wanted to go up and fight that battle. All right, that's in his own wisdom. So how is he going to get some support for that? Well, he calls the prophets, you know, because the king of Judah wants to know what the word of the Lord is. So he calls all the false prophets. They encourage him, go up, go up, and take Ramoth Gilead, and you'll be a success. But, you know, later, whenever we get into uh, further material there in 1 Kings 22, we have a revelation of a scene in heaven where God takes the wise in their own craftiness. That old wicked king of the north said, I'm going to go do it. I'm, I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to get some support here from, from my prophets here. And God takes the wise in their own craftiness. He allowed a deceiving spirit to go down there and prophesy lies through the mouths of those men so that sure enough, this king could fulfill his desire, go up to Ramoth Gilead, but he would not be a success, and he died in the venture. And we read there that a certain man, in the simplicity of his heart, just at venture, drew a bow and pulled it back and shot an arrow. And it, by the providential control of the Almighty God, not even knowing which man he was going to hit, if anyone out there in this array before him, that arrow went through and by the hand of God, found a joint between the pieces of the armor on the chest of the king of Israel and pierced his heart. Now, that would have to be the very hand of God that could direct an arrow to that end. Of all of those Israelites out there, you don't even know which one is the king. We're just told that a certain man drew a bow adventure and just toying shot the air out. Where it lands, nobody knows. Where it lands, God directed it. And it found a division between pieces on his armor and went right into him and killed him. God takes the wise in their own craftiness. Rather than that man listening to the prophet Micaiah, the son of Imlah, who gave the word of the Lord, you're a bad king, you're a false king, don't go up, you go up, you're going to die. If you go up, you're not going to come back. And old Micaiah said, well, put this man in prison and give him a prisoner's rations here until I come back in peace. And Micaiah said, if you come back at all, the Lord has not spoken by me. He put his life on the line right there. You won't come back. King said, if I come back in peace, he said, you won't come back at all. If you come back in peace, if you come back in peace, if you come back at all, the Lord has not spoken by me. Surely enough, he didn't make it back. He didn't make it back alive from that battle. And I don't know what happened to old Micaiah. He didn't pop up too often in the Bible, but there he is. He comes on the scene and he had a word of the Lord. And God took that wise king, wise quote unquote, the wisdom of this world, took him in his own craftiness. I don't know what you thought about that verse in 1 Corinthians, what Paul meant by that, but sometimes what is meant by a phrase like that is God just allows them to go on their deluded way. Because the wise say, I'm going to research and I'm not going to believe what someone else is saying when they're teaching the Bible. I'm going to research this matter out myself and I'm going to study some more. 
And I've got this little paperback book on my shelf, which someone sent me to read, and it's just filled with delusions and garbage. I've got this little paperback book, and I'm going to read it and see if it can help shed some light on the Bible. You better read your Bible and see if it can shed some light on that confusion that you have sitting up on your shelf there. You see, I've got, a sh I've got a study full of books in here, but people don't know how to make use of things. They try to use books and see if it can help confuse them about the Bible and take truth away from the Word of God. You better use your Bible and discern that material that you're reading. This is a little dollar and a quarter paperback book that somebody's reading. That they, and I mean, we're talking about this big 66-book Bible that we have, and this little book here is supposed to have the truth, and it's just filled with lies. I've read it. It's filled with lies all under the guise of deeper truth that nobody has thought of before. Well, I could tell you about the old demon thing. That's been thought of ever since the rabbis were on the scene back in Jesus' day or shortly thereafter. And it's certainly held by, by a large number of people today. Now, something else I want to comment, all of this just in introductory matters, I guess, concerns mysticism. We have a few tapes on mysticism. It's really a plague around today. But here's the irony of it all. We can have people who preach and preach against all this mysticism making inroads into our circles through these outside ministries and influences, and rightly so, you're preaching against that. But you know, then whenever you have need of a little rabbinic mysticism in these early chapters of Genesis, you just dive right in with abandonment. We need to be consistent if we're going to come against mysticism. Have you ever been able to conceive of anything more mystical than a demon, a fallen angel? Now, that is a spirit being that has no body, that takes on some temporary, and I'm not saying they can't, but takes on some temporary visible appearance, mates with a human female, shares a physical seed with her so that he can impregnate her, and she gives birth to a demon-man-child. That is the most mystical, absurd thing that I've ever heard of. For the continuation of this mates with a human female, shares a physical seed with her so that he can impregnate her and she gives birth to a demon-man-child. That is the most mystical, absurd thing that I've ever heard of. has no support in the Word of God. I'll comment more on that later on. That's mysticism, pure and simple. Oh, it's delusion. It's worse than mysticism. So it's one thing to preach against all this mysticism, like I shared with you the other night, that the seed of God in 1 John is the blood of Jesus. Whenever we get saved, then he takes literally some blood from Jesus' body and injects that into us. That's mysticism. And it's a delusion also. And we have some preachers out there preaching things like this, outside ministries and influences who are making inroads into our circle. So some are coming out preaching against all of that mysticism. And I mean preaching against it, calling it mysticism, and saying we need to preach against this mysticism. But then whenever you have need of a little rabbinic mysticism, you just serve up yourself a big heaping of it and dive into Genesis 6, 1 to 4 with abandonment all in this area of mysticism. You know, there is a book out, I think the title of it is Mystery Babylon. It's a very popular anti-Roman Catholic book. I mean, a very popular book. I, I have it. But it is so mystical. Now, did you hear what I just said? The name of the book is Mystery Babylon. It is a, it is a very popular anti-Roman Catholic book. But the reason I have never recommended that book is because it is so mystical. I'm wondering as I read your book whether or not you're called up in that mystery system of Revelation 17 also yourself. They'll go back and try to join all of these fantastic things of the Babylonians and the Egyptians and they had a mother goddess and a child worship service and all of these fantastic things and try to show that Rome got all of their whatever from that. And, you know, you're really drawing water from a well that's probably bone dry. You need to deal with matters like that from the Word of God and not go back and try to find something that you couldn't prove and that nobody else could prove anyway of what happened in Babylon uh, seven millennia ago or what happened down in Egypt eight millennia ago. And that also, by the way, I'm not just mentioning that 
for no reason or for one reason only, Mystery Babylon. That also happens to be a book that's real popular with some other people. And I don't see how a charismatic Christian can ever really get into Mystery Babylon and get much out of it. You'd be better buying what? Lorraine Bettner's book called Roman Catholicism. So you've got, from a scriptural point of view, the mysteries and the tenets of Roman Catholicism dealt with, dealt with scripturally. And without having to go back into Egyptian, Babylonian, Near Eastern, Syrian lore and legend, but deal with things from the Word of God. You know, it's like, oh, I don't know, I, I probably shouldn't get too far off the path, but some of these comic books, these chick comic books, and all, all these other anti-Roman Catholic people, and there are a lot of anti-Roman Catholic people who feel it's their mission to publish material and to research back into ancient Near Eastern history and discover things about the Roman Catholic Church. I don't, think, I don't know that the Roman Catholic Church existed back seven millennia ago. Uh, maybe maybe, maybe you're, you're missing the mark. Maybe all of this is anachronism to go back there and try to say, now I see that the popes came from this and that such and such came from this. Roman Catholic Church didn't even exist back in those days. You ought to deal with the errors of Catholicism and there is a truckload or two of them in it from the Bible. And, and get the Lutherans and Presbyterians while you're at it as well. Get them as well. The Catholics aren't in a group by themselves, friends. All the denominations have departed from the Word of God. God made man upright, and they sought out many denominations to join themselves to. That's right. You didn't know that was in the Bible? Sure. Sure. They sought out their own inventions. That's what denomination is. It's an invention of man. Man's way, man's ideas, man's creeds, man's programs to get God's work done. And never the twain shall meet. And this whole business of sons of God, daughters of men, and mysticism in the early chapters of Genesis, that's not new to me. I was teaching many years ago in another place, and uh, there were some other teachers responsible for teaching in this same institution. And I remember getting a phone call one time in the afternoon from a woman who was a student of mine there, who was also a student of another teacher's. And she kind of liked me for a while anyway. <laughs> but she kind of liked me and my wife and liked my teaching. And she just thought I'd probably be interested in, well, this is what I first thought. And this is what she first told me. And then later she said, I also was trying to feel you out for this whole matter. But she called me and wanted to tell me about this teacher of theirs who was having the most wonderful things to say about Genesis that no one had ever thought of before that whenever God made Adam and Eve, it wasn't a male and a female, it was a male and a female together. The so-called androgynous state, you know, we have a few tapes on that from Genesis. And that whenever Cain and Abel were born, Genesis 4.1 tells us they were twins whenever they were born. The Bible never says that, the Bible doesn't say that they aren't. But people just, there's enough in the Bible to deal with without trying to invent something the Bible doesn't say. And that whenever Eve first gave birth to Cain, then she thought Cain was the promised Messiah, thought he was the seed. And sons of God and daughters of men and all of these things that people, I've got some books on my shelves that teach these various things. And she was sharing all that with me, and I just said, that sounds highly suspicious to me. I hadn't heard of it before then. See, that was my first introduction to it all. I said, that sounds highly suspicious to me. And she said, well, that's what I thought too until he showed it to us from the Bible. Well, that was the end of the conversation. We hung up, and, you know, I got thinking about it that afternoon, and I felt, you know, it's more than highly suspicious. That was polite terminology. That's wrong. God made a man and a woman, not a half-man, half-woman. And so I finally picked up the phone and called her back, and I said, I said, I was a little too polite earlier. My terminology was too generous to the devil's delusion. I said, that's not just something that's, interesting or that's highly suspicious i said it's gone beyond being suspicious that's error that's delusion and she said well, well tell me some more she said i was wondering what you really thought about it so i was glad i finally picked up the phone and called her back and uh, so i then arranged i had an office in this building where i had an intercom in there that was connected to the main auditorium classroom where i could overhear without anyone knowing what was going on in there whenever i wasn't in there so i told her i said i tell you what I'll find out when he's teaching his delusions next time, and I'll be listening in. So I listened in, and I just couldn't believe some of the things I was hearing. I even left my 
office and came down and poked my head in the door to make sure I was seeing him and hearing what he was saying. And sure enough, he was. And so we dealt with that then with those people I was talking to and some of the other people or some of you who are here now. We dealt with it. We have dealt with it since then in the creation series. So this isn't something new. And so when people want to talk about Near Eastern ziggurats or some strange um, on the top of the Andes Mountains configurations in South America, and maybe if we understood more about this, it would help us give ourselves insight into the origins of the occult and the origins of idolatry and the origins of the zodiac. You know, these strange South American configurations pop up in National Geographic every now and then. I'm not uh, naive to those matters. And so people have theorized. You ought to read some of the articles on that. Well, now, was this? A lot of people believe those were aliens from other planets that many millennia ago visited this planet and set up these, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever read these strange configurations uh, or Stonehenge in England or whatever? You've got all these things that people wonder. They wonder how these things originated. And there are some really odd things in South America. So now, was this aliens, or, oh, race of giants, demons, fallen angels, whenever they fell to the earth and mated with human females and went to South America and drew these things up? Oh, I don't know. I, I still think that you're drawing water out of a well that's bone dry. You need to get back into the Word of God, and why try to see something in the Word that's not there when I'm always saying we have more than we can even deal with that is there, and that's clearly there. But that's, that's the devil's ploy there, to get people interested in some type of fantastic, mythical, checkout line, tabloid-type story. I think people have been reading too many of the checkout line tabloids of the births of monster babies than reading the Word of God. Amen. We need to stay in the Word. And I, who was it? Was it Augustine of old who said, if, 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 we say, if we say that we are studying the Bible and that we believe the Bible, we believe what we want to about the Bible, then it's not God that we believe but ourselves. That's how I guess he said it. If, if we say that we believe the Bible, we're really not believing the Bible, it's ourselves that we believe and not God and not God's Word. And I think that's, that's true with a lot of people. Well, let's get into Genesis 6 and the question. Maybe that's enough of introduction that would touch in every other delusion or deception as well. I asked somebody one time on the phone, why? I mean, why do you even want to believe this? It's not in the Bible, but you want to believe it anyway, so why? Quote, it helps explain a lot of things. What do you mean it helps explain a lot of things? A lie can never help explain anything. Explain what? The existence of giants? Well, I have to inform people, and you could probably read another translation and you'd find it the same. The giants existed before the sons of God and daughters of men came together. Look at Genesis 6 and verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. The giants were in the earth before. Now that term giant in verse 4 is Nephilim, and that does refer to a giant by virtue of physical stature. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, in other words, later, afterwards, the giants already existed. After that, the sons of God and the daughters of men came together. And children were born unto them. No question about the fact they had literal offspring. And the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now the Hebrew term is the gibberim. And gibberim doesn't refer to physical stature. Those are two different words there. The giants, in other words, what they hope that it will help explain is the origin of giants. And number one, the giants were already here before the sons of God came into the daughters of men. And number two, whenever the sons of God did come into the daughters of men, they did not produce giants. They produced Mighty men which were of old, men of renown. The Bible doesn't say giants. Not your King James translation and not the Hebrew. The Hebrew says gibberim, important, significant men. 
leading men, leading figures, men of renown. That's why the King James translators didn't translate it giant, but they translated it, you know, from a social perspective, men of renown, that they were leading important men. So, again, then people will say, well, it helps us explain things about the zodiac, and some people are real interested, maybe too interested, in occultism and idolatry, its origins, idolatry. I've heard a lot on that, enough to drive you up the wall. And the zodiac. But I want to give you a list of several points, and I didn't compare this with my earlier notes, so I'm sure there'll be some things the same. Maybe there'll be some things different. And maybe there'll be some things I don't say here that you could find on that February the 9th, 1983 tape entitled The Giants of Genesis 6. But I want to share just a few points with you because people are still, uh, still deluded about this matter. So let's get into that, and this will probably be the heart of our study. In the first place, this is where I guess we have to start. We have to identify the sons of God. The sons of God. I think anybody, whether you're on the demon side or the human side of this passage, uh, people believe that the sons of God is a, is a literary expression. I mean, why does it just tell us who they are? Why does it call them sons of God and then very clearly and distinctly daughters of men? Not daughters of God and sons of men, or not sons of God and, son and daughters of God, but sons of God and daughters of men. There's a play. Something is intended. We're to understand something from that. Can you see what I'm saying there? It doesn't say sons of God, daughters of God, or daughters of God, sons of men. It's sons of God, daughters of men. And so, of course, one theory is that this refers to fallen angels. Well, here's what we have said about that earlier, and I just want to reiterate this again, that no fallen angel is ever called a son of God. That is preposterous. Now, the passage they like to make use of and rest it to their own destruction is Job chapter 38. If you'll turn over there, Job 38 and verse 7. I remember that uh, other people, Brother Freeman, held to this demon theory. He was an heir in that regard also. And I believed it at one time because I'd never thought myself, just whatever somebody else says, and that sounds pretty fantastic about Genesis 6, and you think, well, yeah, I bet I've got a truth that the denoms don't, and you've got something they don't have, some of them, but you've got something wrong that they don't have. They wouldn't want it. Some of them have it, though. That's too bad. But people have never sat down really in thought until they hear us saying things, and they've got to then, and that, that's the problem with ever trying to share the truth with someone who you find out in the end is not going to receive it because then that helps them go and refine their arguments against the word of God. The people just think, yeah, sons of God. And look, and, and you know over here in Job 38, 7, that the angels are referred to as the sons of God. Or I guess pretty much everyone believes this. When the morning stars sang together, the angels could be re referred to as stars, and so can earthly leaders of the churches in Revelation, and so can God's people, the nation of Israel, in Genesis uh, 17 and in Daniel 8, and maybe somewhere else. I smile while I say it, but... When the morning stars sang together, this is parallelism, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The morning stars are not different than the sons of God, it's parallelism. Synonymous parallelism. The sons of God are the morning stars. And you read just the, the verses preceding this about the creation of the world. That the angels witnessed and rejoiced at God's created handiwork. They shouted for joy whenever they watched God create the world. Now a whole lot of people don't know when the angels were created. We're not going to get into that because we have a lot of teaching on tape about that, but I've heard in our own circles back some time ago that the angels were probably made before Genesis 1-1. Before, that says in the beginning. That's when things began. Well, people say that's just in view of the earth or in view of the things that we can see here. No, I believe that's in the very beginning. And so on the basis of Job 38, if the angels rejoice whenever they watch God create the world, they must be some of the first things created then. They couldn't be created down on the sixth day like man was. 
Man didn't witness the creation of the world. He's about the last thing created. The angels must have been some of the first things created so that whenever they watched God on the second day and the third day, fourth, fifth, sixth, they rejoiced. They shouted for joy. Now, here's what people do. And there's, there's a subtle miss in the link of the connection here. But they see this in Job 38, 7, and they end up with this conclusion that the angels could be referred to as the sons of God. There's no question about that. They can and, in fact, are. The angels are the sons of God. So then we turn back to Genesis 6, 2, and we apply that same spirit or interpretation here. Sons of God, then, are the angels. But here's the big thing that no one has ever even thought of before. That those angels over there, those sons of God over there in Job 38, 7, are in an unfallen state, though. Surely we're not going to say that fallen angels are rejoicing whenever God's creating the world. Those are pure angels. Those are probably all the angels who have not fallen yet. Which would bring up another question, when did the angels fall? Well, I think we've kind of discussed some of that before as well. Obviously, it would have to be after the creation week, but before the temptation. Didn't take long, because there's only a brief period of time in there between the end of creation, and I've heard other theories. You just wouldn't believe what people can dream up here, but I, we've covered that in very good detail. God gave Adam and Eve a mandate to propagate themselves, to fill up the earth, to reproduce and fill up the earth. And I can't imagine them just intending on putting that off for 14 or 18 years. And yet, they don't have a child born, we know, until Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. So all of, the, all of that taking place between Genesis 1 and Genesis 4 has to take place in a very, very short period of time. That just is common sense, and I think that's also in agreement with the reading, a plain reading and understanding of the early chapters in the book of Genesis. But you see what people have done. They, they know that over in Job, the angels are referred to as the sons of God. That, that you can put an equal sign in between sons of God and angels. You can put sons of God equal angels. So when they come over here and they say, let's identify sons of God, then they'll do it that way. Sons of God equal angels. But of course, fallen, right? Obviously fallen here in this chapter. Well, now wait a minute. You don't have a single shred of support in the word of God for calling a fallen angel a son of God. You can't use Job 38.7. Those are non-fallen angels over there. You see, that, that would mean that we should be a, as comfortable calling New Testament demons sons of God as we are calling these fallen angels sons of God back here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 6. Or 6 and verse 2. I could take it even further. We could call Satan the son of God. The son of God. Satan is the son of God. I, I find myself very uncomfortable using terminology like that. So the counter-argument is, well, it speaks only of origin or derivation. We don't mean this in some type of spiritual sense or relationship here. In Genesis 6, 2, sons of God, it simply means that these creatures, and these people believe they're fallen angels or demons, I don't know which they want to make of that, or maybe they don't even try to distinguish, but these creatures here owe their origin to God. So, son of God is a phrase used in the sense of derivation or origin. And this is supposed to soften the offensive nature of the language. Calling Satan a son of God, demons sons of God, fallen angels sons of God. That's offensive language to a Christian. So, they try to soften that by saying it speaks only of origin or derivation. Well, again, then we should be equally comfortable calling the demons that Jesus faced in his ministry the sons of God. Don't they owe their existence to God as well? I'm not saying they're fallen state. I'm saying don't they owe their origin, their derivation to God? We should be equally comfortable calling demons sons of God. And yet I don't think any true believer is comfortable calling them sons of God. And as I said earlier, we could take that a step further. We should be equally comfortable calling Satan the son of God. As we are, if all we mean by that is origin, Satan had his origin in God. God made Satan. He couldn't exist if God didn't make him. God made all things. We don't have to add in he didn't make him in a fallen state. We're only talking about origin or derivation here. 
But that is not what we find in the New Testament. Demons are not called the sons of God. Angels in the New Testament, fallen angels are not called the sons of God. Satan is not called the son of God. In Job 38, 7, fallen angels are not called sons of God. Those are non-fallen angels there. You don't have a verse to stand on. You say, well, except Genesis 6, 2. But the way you got your interpretation of that is to run to other passages up. It should just be common sense that we don't call fallen creatures, we don't call the mass of humanity out there who, who is outside Christ sons of God. Jesus calls them sons of Satan. Satan, your father, John 8, 44. And by the way, that's the comment I want to make here. The Bible, with few exceptions, whenever it speaks of son of, in, in these type of contexts, it is not talking about origin or derivation. It's talking about a spiritual relationship. Take Jesus as the Son of God. Now the cults, you see, will try to use that very phrase, just like some deceived people are with sons of God here in Genesis 6, 2, to say that means that Jesus owes his origin to God. God is the Father who produced, created whatever, the Son. That's the exact same technique. And the same tactic employed used by the religious cults out there. They take this phrase, son of God. I mean, what are you going to do with that? Jesus is called all over the Bible, the son of God. The son of God? Does that mean he owes his origin to or that he is derived from God? There's no way. He is from everlasting and to everlasting. That phrase, son of, doesn't speak of origin or derivation. It speaks of relationship. It's, it, it speaks of a spiritual connection here. Or you could take John 8, 44 that I just referred to. Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Now, he doesn't mean derivation or origin. Those people owe their origin to God. He's talking about a spiritual connection or relationship. You are of your father, the devil. Or I could give you some other phrases. How about in the Old Testament, we often read of the sons of Belial. Belial was an Old Testament word that referred to the devil, the sons of Belial, the sons of Belial. All these are spiritual phrases. Or the sons of the prophets. Do we really mean the prophets had some physical sons? Well, they may have had, but that's not what that phrase means. You see what I'm saying? It simply means there's a connection between the two, between these men and the prophets. And so they are called the sons of the prophets. Now, about the only place I can remember where... It's this phrase, son of God, in particular, son of God, not sons of the prophets or sons of Belial or sons of Satan, but that this phrase, son of God, is used in a sense of origin or derivation. It would be over in Luke's genealogy, chapter 3, where contrary to Matthew, who works his way forward, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so forth, down to Jesus, Luke works his backwards, Jesus, and he starts working backwards, and he ends up with Adam, the son of God. Adam, the son of God, is about the last thing you'll find in, in Luke chapter 3. Well, I, d I do think that speaks of origin or derivation because that's what the whole chapter has been showing, the son of, the son of, the son of. So you let the passage interpret itself. The context, in other words, in the genealogy of Luke 3, listen to what we're calling it, the genealogy, is obviously a context of origin or derivation, the son of, the son of, the son of. So when you get back to Adam and it says the son of God, it means he owes his origin or derivation to God. But you can only end up with that because the context is very clearly coming down on that side. So our first point here is that no fallen angel or demon is ever called a son of God. That should just be obvious. That's a preposterous notion. Secondly, I said back under the first point, we should be equally comfortable calling Satan a son of God? Well, secondly, some people are willing to do that. They say, well, there's no problem having fallen angels referred to as the sons of God in Genesis 6-2 because Satan himself is called a son of God. Give me chapter and verse on that. All right, they think they can, but it just shows how people don't read the Bible. If you turn over to Job chapters 1 and 2. Yeah, they will actually say that Satan is called a son of God. So you see, if they can get you on that one, 
And they'll get you quiet and you're thinking about that. Well, yeah, I guess I wasn't so smart after all. Now, if you've got the word of God on your side, you're always smart, even when you're dumb. Just keep saying, you're an heir and the Bible's true. But they think if they can get you there where you're having to admit that Satan is called a son of God, then it's less of a thing for you to admit that the fallen angels are called sons of God. And they think, I would say, give me chapter and verse. Well, there's no chapter and verse. But they think they have uh, two in Job. Book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6. You know, it's interesting how they misuse and twist scriptures. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came. All right, now, so we've got biblical proof now again, because I guess everybody believes this refers to angelic beings here. We've got biblical proof again that angels can be called sons of God. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Do you see that and and that also? He is distinguished from the sons of God. The sons of God refer to the unfallen elect angels here. Now, I know there'd be other people who say, well, no, this refers to the same sons of God back there in Genesis 6 2, fallen angels. Well, we'll deal with that theory more from another passage here in a moment. All I'm trying to show you here is that you could never use this passage to prove that Satan is called a son of God. The sons of God came, and Satan came also. Now, if I say Mary and Luke came, and John came also, I'm not saying that John is either Mary or Luke, am I? I'm saying he's different from Mary and Luke. Why can't people just read? You can't whenever your eyes are colored because you'd rather believe a delusion than the truth. And you'll get it in chapter 2 and verse 1 as well. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. He is distinguished from them. Satan is not a son of God. You will not have chapter and verse for Satan being called a son of God. The Bible has much description of him, even back in his pre-fallen state. He was the anointed cherub that covered in Ezekiel 28, but he is not the Son of God. A person has almost taken blasphemy upon their lips to call Satan the Son of God. I thought Jesus was the Son of God. So that sounds like sarcasm. It is. You have to use sarcasm sometimes against people who are deluded. Now, Job 1 and 2 are fantastically interesting chapters here. They, along with other portions of the Word of God, like 1 Kings 22, give us some of our most incredible insight into what goes on in the courts of heaven. And I would assume that had God not given us Job 1 and Job 2 and 1 Kings 22, probably none of us would have the truth on what happens in the courts of heaven. Because I would assume that we would probably all think that evil angels, evil spirits, have no access. And certainly Satan has no access to the throne of God. That would probably just be a belief that Christians would have. The Bible corrects that if we were ever to hold to that. The Bible lets us know that the throne of God is actually there and Satan himself has access to it. And I believe down to this day. And that the angels evidently go back. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. That is to, I guess, report in that they go back. This is all in the spiritual world. This message.